Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ishraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Habibi ilahi al-alameen abil qasim al-mustafa Muhammad. Allahumma salam. وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانئك هو الأبتر آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم In addition to being social creatures, scholars suggest that human beings are also cultured beings. And that culture has a great amount of impact, a significant impact on our lives as both individuals and as members of society. In many cases, culture defines and shapes our values, what we value, our attitudes, our interactions with one another, and our roles in all, of, in all aspects of our lives. And one of the very prominent factors which culture has a great influence on in shaping and defining is that of gender roles and gender norms. You'll notice across the globe, in whichever society we face, society for the most part and culture for the most part has had a great influence on gender roles on what is considered appropriate and inappropriate for men and women to do. How are men supposed to act? How are men not supposed to act? How are women supposed to act? How are women not supposed to act in the various aspects of our lives? Culture has defined these roles and is per pervasive in defining these roles. For instance, will notice that in certain societies, the female or the woman is, is honored when she considers herself to be a completely independent source of achievement. When she is able to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, achieve a high standard of education, when she is able to get a very good job, when she's able to make a good income and she does so completely independent when it's all based on her very own individual accomplishments. When she's not restricted or limited by relationships such as marriage, such as being a wife or being a mother. For certain societies, this is the ideal honor for women is when she's completely independent of any other relationships. She's not tied by the shackles of being a wife or being a mother, for instance, or being a daughter. In other societies, women, their role in society is to be subservient to their fathers, to their husbands, to the home, where they put all of their own and all of their individual and personal needs and desires, they put them aside for what? For the family. Some societies even go to the extreme where they consider the woman to be a source of shame and evil. And as a result, women should be isolated. They should be uh, put aside and not allowed to go into the public in order to do what? In order to stop the spread of evil. 
There's considered a source of evil and shame. And there are many different societies across the globe, whether we go to the West or whether we go to the East, that we notice there are various standards set by certain cultures and societies in the way that they perceive the role of men and women. Today, we notice that all across the globe, women are still regrettably fighting for some of their basic rights. In certain societies, women still, in today's day and age, don't have the right to vote don't have the right to participate in public. They don't have the right to work. They don't have the right to get an education, to go to school. In some societies, women are not allowed to go out in public alone. They're not allowed to drive a vehicle, and so on and so forth. Across the globe, women today are still fighting for their rights. And we're not just talking about second or third or fourth or fifth world countries. Because when we talk about women fighting for their rights, immediately the first thing that comes to mind is we're talking about those countries over there, those backward countries. But even right here in our own, very own United States of America, and all of you are aware, women until today are fighting for equal pay, for to receive an equal wage, she does the same job that a man does, but until today in the 21st century in the United States of America, women still do not get paid the same amount as men. It's a little bit better than before, but still women are fighting for equal pay. And so the struggle continues all across the globe. And this, has, this is not something new. When we go and we examine history, we notice that many societies, they, the way that they treated their women was based on dishonor. They dishonored their women. Women, for the most part, were considered as second-class citizens in many different societies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he, gov he gives us the example of the pre-Islamic er Arabs. The Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula before the advent, before the, the rise of Islam. The Quran tells us that during that time, the Arabs, they held contradictory views regarding the status of women. The Quran tells us that some of them, in, in addition to worshiping idols, they would also worship the angels or the images of the angels whom they considered to be the daughters of God. And as a result, they used to worship them. But on the other hand, there were also those who saw and considered women as a source of shame. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, here there's a contradictory view. On the one hand, women are considered as goddesses and they are worshipped and they are considered the daughters of God. And on the other hand, they're a source of shame. They're a source of anger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that when one father would be what? When the news of a newborn girl would be brought to him, what would happen? He would be uh, uh, enveloped. In, in, in shame and di disgrace and anger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ضَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ When the news would come that he has a baby daughter, the father has a newborn baby daughter, he would become completely angry. He would be enraged. Yet on the other hand, the angels were considered the daughters of God and they were also worshipped. When we come to Islam, Islam comes and it gives us a unique perspective on the role of men and women in society. In Islam, the Quran tells us that the unique contributions 
of both men and women are greatly valued and honored in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as members of a society who contribute to the betterment of society. Yet on, at the same time, the individuality of each gender and each person is also respected. Islam takes a middle course. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in terms of origin, in terms of capacity for good, men and women are the same. They are the same. Allah tells us in numerous verses in the Quran, many verses in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, as for the origin of man and woman, it's not that the woman was created from the man or the man was created from the woman. Allah tells us very clearly in the Quran that both were created from one source, from the same source. And as for their capacity, Allah tells us time and time again that they, that they both have an equal capacity to do good. Allah tells us, إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ Verily the Muslim men and the Muslim women, the believing men and the believing women, the righteous men and the righteous women, the praying men and the praying women, the fasting men and the fasting women, the modest men and the modest women. Allah gives us a long list of men and women. He brings them together. In the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَعَدَّ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا he has prepared, God has prepared for them what? Forgiveness, the capacity to forgive them, to bestow His mercy upon them. وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا And a great reward. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيعُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ وَأُنْثَى Allah says, I make a promise that I will never dismiss or neglect the good works of either of you, whether you're a male or a female. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the same capacity. Our spiritual capacity is the same capacity. There is spiritual equality between men and women when it comes to the Islamic perspective. So Islam neither considers women angels nor, nor devils. Men and women both have the same capacity. They have the same capacity for good, and they have the same capacity for evil. When we come to Islam, we notice that although Islam recognizes this spiritual equality, this innate ability for both men and women to do good, however, Islam also recognizes a unique feature, a unique characteristic of women and it appreciates this. And this is what? This is the, the female's ability to conceive and to bring birth, to give birth. And in fact, this is seen in the Islamic perspective. This is seen as having, giving the woman a huge and potential role for a great contribution in society. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about women in the Qur'an and especially the status of mothers, we know that the status of mothers is one that is great in Islam. In a number of verses, Allah tells us. In Surah Luqman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ And we have commanded that each individual does what respects and honors both parents, بِوَالِدَيْهِ, both of them. And then Allah says what? حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى His mother carried him with pain upon pain. This is amazing here. Allah says respect for both parents is incumbent. It's an obligation. Why? Because the mother, immediately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He goes to the accomplishments of the mother, the contribution of the mother. Because the mother bore him or her with pain upon pain. حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this meaning. In the famous hadith that one day a man, he came to our sixth imam, al-imam al-sadiq alayhi salam and he told him, Ya ibn Rasulullah, who should I respect more, my father or my mother? The imam told him, your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your mother. He said, then who? He said, then your father. In Islam, we understand 
that respect and honor for our mothers is threefold more, three times greater than the respect and honor that is expected towards our fathers. In the very famous hadith, which all of us have memorized, we all know, the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he says what? He says, Ajannatu tahta aqdam al ummahat. So beautiful. He says, Paradise lies at the feet of mothers. Do you want to know the status of a mother in Islam? The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, says, Paradise lies at the feet of the mother. But it's not because of just the physical contribution. It's not just because the woman is able to conceive and give birth and that's why paradise lies at her feet or that's why she should be respected more than the father. But it's because of her role in the education, in the morality, in the spirituality of the child. That contribution and that role that the mother has. We know that physically, before the child is born, the child stays in the womb of the mother for an average of nine months. And scientists and many studies, they tell us that during this very important time that the, the fetus, the child and the mother, they develop a very strong bond. There's a very strong bond. The only, the, the source of nutrition for this child, physical nutrition, is the mother, right? And this is why doctors, they emphasize that if a woman is pregnant, that she takes extra care of her body, she takes extra care of herself, because whatever she puts in her body will reflect in the child. The child will also absorb. And as a result, she is expected to take extra care of herself. But not only that, it's not just a physical bond, but that there is an emotional bond also. There is a spiritual bond that is formulated between the mother and the child during this time. And then even afterwards, after the child is born, we notice in many cases that the first caretaker of the child is whom? In most cases, is the mother. The first caretaker of the child, the one who nurtures the child, physically nurtures the child, and even emotionally nurtures the child. In fact, certain studies, they say that even in certain societies where large numbers of mothers and females have gone into the workforce, and they're working, and they're having children while they're working, even during that time, the vast majority of the burden of taking care of the child falls on the shoulder of whom? On the mother. Certain statistics put it at 75%. 75% of the burden of taking care of the child, although both the father and the mother are working, 75% of the burden falls on the shoulder of the mother. She's the first spiritual, emotional, moral caretaker of the child. And as a result, because of this capacity, because of this potential, we realize the immense responsibility of this position. Unfortunately, because of the mixed messages that different societies give regarding the status of women, the role of women, because of this, many times we hear certain grievances. A mother who has you know, a number of children who she begins to lament that she does not feel fulfilled. She feels that she has put her education maybe or her career on the side and she has to take care of children for instance or she has to take care of the home and so she considers herself just a stay-at-home mother. And she laments this. When, when we look at reality, we notice that this in fact is a critical role the role of a mother is not something to be dismissed or neglected or looked down upon. It's not. Because in fact, mothers who take care of their children, who nurture their children, are not just stay-at-home moms. They're the shapers of the future. They're the ones who are shaping the future generation. Yes, in most cases across the world and even the society that we live in, the society mostly is a patriarchal society. 
Men are usually taking care of things, whether it's politics or economics. The vast majority of, of things are taken care of by men. I mean, it's not something new. It's not something that's hidden. Most of the politicians, most of the leaders, most of the people occupying big positions, whether it's CEOs or, you know, in, in, in politics or, or in economics or, you know, in, in the social sphere or what have you. And so, in most cases, it's, it's the men that are doing these things. However, the women have to remember, and especially those who decide that they want to become mothers, that they are in fact shaping the future generation. The amount of input, the amount, the capacity of effort, or the amount of effort that they put in taking care of these children will shape the future of society. In many cases, unfortunately, some women, they grieve. They say it's not something fulfilling. Motherhood, I feel like everyone is getting ahead. Everyone's, you know, going up the ladder. They're getting good jobs. They're getting promotions. They're getting a good education. They're doing all of these great things. And I'm stuck here at home with kids. It should not be looked upon in that manner. Yes, of course, when it comes to the capacity, the educational capacity uh, and, and fulfillment, this is very important. However, we should not look down upon the role of a mother because we know that this role is a very important role and it has great potential for shaping the future. When we come to Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us a number of examples in the Quran. And if we look at history, we notice a number of examples of mothers who were able to shape the future, who were able to bring up powerful individuals and powerful leaders. If we look at the case of the mothers of Prophet Ishaq and Prophet Ismail, they came from different mothers. Ishaq came from Sarah, Sarah, Isaac, and Ishmael or Ismail came from Hajar. Both of these women were able to raise prophets. In the story of Prophet Ismail alayhi salam, the well-known story, according to the Quran, it was Ishmael or Ismail who was taken by his father Ibrahim in order to be what? In order to be sacrificed. When Prophet Abraham alayhi salam, when he went and he told Ismail of this news, this command, this dream that he had, what did Prophet Ismail say? He says, Satajiduni insha'Allahu in as You will find me if God wills, God willing, you will find me to be patient. This did not come out of nowhere. Prophet Ismail was not able to say, oh yes, he didn't just wake up one morning and his father told him, I'm going to slaughter you today. And he said, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Let's, let's go with it. No, it did not come out of nowhere. Because before this, Prophet Ibrahim was commanded to take Hajar and baby Ismail and to take them to the valley of Bekka at the time it was called Bekka, which is present day Mecca, and to leave them there alone. And when he told his wife Hajar about this, she expressed what? She expressed patience. She told him, yes, if this is a command by God, then I will express patience. I will show patience. So it did not come out of nowhere that Ismail was also able to express patience. This was the upbringing of his mother who she single-handedly took care of him for a large portion of his infancy and youth. It was not until later that Prophet Ibrahim السلام, he returned when Ismail had grown up. The story of Prophet Musa السلام, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the mother of Prophet Musa. Interestingly, in the Quran there is no mention of the father of Prophet Musa. No mention of the father of Moses, this great prophet of history. There's no mention of his father, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about his mother. Ila ummi Musa, And we revealed, we inspired to the mother of Moses to do what? To let him go, to put him in the basket and let him go. It was this great mother 
and in addition to his mother, whom the wife of Pharaoh, Asiya, who she took, him, she took Musa alayhi salam into her own home and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he commends her. He says that she is an example for all. وَضَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا And God gives an example to all those who believe the wife of Pharaoh, who was Asiya bint Muzahim. It was because of these two women who were able to raise a prophet and a leader such as Prophet Moses alayhi salam. The case of Prophet Isa. Prophet Isa, of course, he did not have a father. He only had a mother. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not just talk about the mother of Jesus, Mary, Maryam. He talks about whom? He talks about his grandmother also. Allah first, when he tells us the story in the Quran of the birth of Prophet Isa, Jesus alayhi salam, he tells us first, before he goes into the story of Mary and Jesus, he goes into what? The story of the mother of Mary. And he talks about how she would pray and how she had devoted herself to righteousness and to worship of Allah. And as a result, God gave her Maryam alayhi salam, whom through Maryam, God then gave them Jesus. Isa Allah tells us these examples one by one he gives us these examples in history we notice the example of how our holy prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam of his mother of the mother of prophet Muhammad and also of the lady who took care of him Halima who took care of him, who was also a very pious woman. History tells us that she was a very righteous woman. And his mother, in addition, the mother of Amir al-Mu'mineen, who after the death of the Prophet's mother, peace be upon him, the Prophet went into the care of whom? He went into the house of Abu Talib. And he went into the house of the father and mother of Amir al-Mu'mineen, of Imam Ali alayhi salam. And she took care of him. History tells us that she took care of him just like a son. And that he was very attached to her. And that when she passed away, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he entered into the grave and he placed his shirt on her. This is the devotion that he had towards her. That such an individual, the Prophet, peace be upon him, was put in the care of these honorable women, these righteous women, who did everything in their capacity to take care of this man who would become the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. Of course, on the flip side, the Quran and history also gives us examples of individuals who their mothers also took the bad route. Bad individuals who perhaps they were influenced by their mothers. The Quran gives us a clear example. He tells us the wife of Prophet Nuh, Noah alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says his wife did what? She decided to betray him. His wife and the wife of Prophet Lut. Allah says these two, they betrayed their husbands who were prophets of God. And then what ended up happening? The son of Nuh, he also betrayed his father. When the flood came, the Quran tells us that before the flood arrived, Prophet Nuh, he turned to his family and those around him and he tried to bring them in. He warned them of a punishment, of a flood. Some of them they came, others they denied. One of the person who denied was the son of a prophet. Prophet Nuh is, holds a, a high and exalted position in Islam and in the Quran. Yet, because of the influence of his mother, he also took the wrong course. He also turned away from the truth. And these examples, they tell us. They show us very clearly. And there are many, many examples, both from history and during contemporary times. Of course, this is not always the case. But there are many examples to suggest the great impact that a mother has on the life of her family and on the life of the children. And how she shapes the future of 
these children. There's a great example for us in history, and that is Lady Fatima alayhi salam, who is one of the greatest mothers in history. And the reason why I bring her up with this title as a mother, although she deserves so many different titles, and although she excelled in every aspect of her life, but the reason why I consider her one of the greatest, if not the greatest mother in history, is because even the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam Even the Prophet, he witnessed and he experienced the motherly love of Fatima. If we go back to history, history tells us that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam, she lost her mother Khadija, Umm al-Mu'mineen Khadija alayhi salam, when she was very young, maybe five or six years old. And that's a very difficult time to lose a mother. It's very difficult. It's not easy. It's difficult for grown men and women to lose their parents. But for a child at that tender age to lose his or her mother is very difficult. Yet Fatima alayhi salam, under all of those circumstances, under the siege that was being placed upon her and her family, under all of those very difficult circumstances, she was still able to express a great amount of compassion and love to the point that when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, he would go out, he would frequently be a victim of the people's oppression. People would insult him, people would assault him, they would throw things at him, they would throw trash at him, and he would come home with a heart broken. He would come home, Fatima alayhi salam, at this tender age, this young age, she would wipe the dirt off her father. He would look at her and immediately he would forget all of his problems to the point where the Prophet, peace be upon him, he called her, he said, Fatima Ummu Abiha. She is the mother of her father. Because of the great amount of compassion that the Prophet, peace be upon him, witnessed from his daughter Fatima al Zahra. Today, brothers and sisters, the world is riddled with problems. Just one example. Look at how the world is riddled with selfishness, with egotism, with greed. People who are just looking out for their own good. We see this on a local level. We see this within families when husbands or wives, parents or children, when all they care about is themselves. We see this, you know, in, in, at work where bosses or employees, their entire objective is to get ahead at the expense of others, they don't care. We see this on the street, we see this in the market, we see this everywhere. The world is filled with egotism. It's filled with people who are just concerned about themselves. It's filled with greed and selfishness. Whereas when we take the example of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam for today, the 21st century, today, we notice that Fatima and her life provides us a prime example. She is a paragon of virtue and selflessness and giving and compassion. And this is really what we need. The world today needs an example like the example of Lady Fatima alayhi salam. She teaches us altruism and selflessness. She teaches her children at a very young age. The very famous hadith, Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he says, one day I was sitting with my mother Fatima and she was engaged in worship and prayers and supplications. And I heard her praying for, you know, the community, praying for friends, praying for, uh, you know, others around. And she kept going on and on and on. And then I looked up towards her and Imam Hassan was young at this time. He says, I looked up towards my mother and I said, mother, I heard you bring the names of people, you know, our neighbors, relatives, companions, other people, our friends. But I didn't hear you bring up my name 
or my brother Hussein's name, or my sister's name, or my father's name. I didn't hear you bring up any of our names. You forgot to pray for us. Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam, she looks at her young son Hassan, she says, Bunay al Jar, thumma dar. The neighbor before oneself. She teaches the Imam at a young age the meaning of selflessness, the meaning of altruism, the meaning for compassion for others and looking out for the well being of others before oneself. Before oneself. And this is a great lesson for us today, brothers and sisters. If the world were to take this example from Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, just this example from her, it would be enough to change this world to a better place. When we look for the well-being of others and we are concerned for the well-being of others before ourselves and regardless. Here Fatima says, the neighbor at Jar Thummaddar, regardless who this neighbor is. This neighbor is a family member, is a stranger, this neighbor is Shia, Sunni, this neighbor is Muslim, non-Muslim, Jewish, Christian, an atheist, an agnostic, whoever it may be. Fatima to Zahra, she says, you should look out for your neighbor's well-being before yours. And this is a great lesson that we can learn. A great lesson that we learn today in the 21st century from Fatima to Zahra is that of generosity, of giving. Fatima shows us, and it's because of this selflessness, she constantly would sacrifice, she would give. There's a lot of sacrifice in today's day, but a lot of it is for personal gains. We sacrifice for what? For personal gain. I sacrifice something in order to gain something bigger myself. There is very little sacrifice for others and for the betterment of humanity and society as a whole. Fatima Tazara alayhi salam, time and time again, she would express to us examples where she was generous and kind and giving to others. The very famous story on the night of her wedding. Brothers when I, and sisters, when I think about this story, I'm always amazed. I'm always amazed. I don't know why it's particularly amazing. I think that many of you also perhaps feel the same that a woman on one of the most, if not the most important night of her life, her wedding day, and we know this in many cases, one of the most important days is the wedding day. And as a result, the woman would like to wear the wedding dress. It's important. This is across all cultures. All cultures, they make sure that this day is an important day. The woman wears a wedding dress. On this day, Fatima Tazara alayhi salam gives up her own brand new wedding dress to a woman who's in need. And she has no replacement. It's not that she had two or three in her wardrobe and she said, well, it's fine, I have another one. She had no replacement. And as a result, she had her wedding in her normal dress. She gave up her own wedding dress because someone is in need. This is the true meaning of generosity. This is the true meaning of altruism. This is the true meaning of giving. And this is the lesson that we learn from Fatima al Zahra. Fatima al Zahra was unburdensome. History tells us that she never asked for anything. She never asked for anything. She would not even, Amir al Mu'mineen, Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam, during the final moments of her life, Fatima al Zahra, she turns to Imam Ali and she tells him that I want you to forgive me if I've ever burdened you with anything during our life. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he turns to Fatima, he begins to weep. He says, Fatima, you never asked me for anything. You never asked me to get up and bring you a cup of water, let alone other things. You never burdened me or anyone else with anything. This is the kindness, this is the altruism, this is the generosity, this is the selflessness that we learn from Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. Is there a better example and a better role model for us today in this day and age? This was the life of Fatima through her, both her personal and her social roles. Fatima al Zahra was able to fully embrace the message 
of Islam and she paved the way for the future of Islam through her message, through her sacrifice, through her giving. She was able to pave the way for the future of Islam and indeed in this there are great lessons for us. Tonight we commemorate the legacy of this lady. The narrations, they tell us that during the final moments of the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when he had gathered his family members close by, Fatima, she was sitting there and she was weeping. She was crying. It's very difficult for her to let go of her dear father who, he had, who she had established such a strong relationship with. And so she's sitting there, she's weeping. The narration says that the Holy Prophet, he told her, come, come close to me, my dear father. He brought her close. He whispered, the Prophet, peace be upon him, whispered something in her ear. Fatima, alayhi salam, she began to cry. She began to weep. And then he whispered something else. Fatima, alayhi salam, she smiled. She became happy. After the death of the Prophet, she was asked, the wife of the Prophet Aisha, she asked her, she said, Fatima, during the final moments of the Prophet's life, something happened. I want you to explain this to me. Why did you cry and laugh when the Prophet whispered something? What did he say to you? She said, when he first brought me close, he told me, my dear Fatima, I'm leaving very soon. And this broke my heart. To hear from my father that he's departing this life, he's leaving this life, this was very difficult for me to hear. But then he brought me close again and he told her, My dear Fatima, don't weep, for you are the first person to come. You are the first person after me from the family members to come. And we will meet again very soon. And this is exactly what happened. After the demise of the Prophet, peace be upon him, for the next three months, these were some of the most difficult days for the Ahlul Bayt and especially for Fatima al-Zahra. History tells us that one of the very first tragedies was that the home of Fatima was attacked. She was squeezed behind the door, in between the door and the wall, causing her much pain and suffering, causing her to miscarry her infant Muhsin. And then when she would go out and she would weep and mourn for her father, she was banished. She was not allowed to do so, so she had to go outside, out in the outskirts of the city of Medina in order to weep for her father, Rasulullah. And the days came by until the final moments of the life of Fatima al-Zahra, alayhi salam Historians tell us that on the third day of Jamaad al-Thani, was the day in which Fatima alayhi salam departed this life. I'd like to end with a short poem that I wrote in eulogy of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. On the third day of the month of Jamadi, on the third day of the month of Jamadi fell the daughter of Al-Mustafa Al-Hadi. Have I asked why? For she was so young in age. Why was she the object of the people's rage? Was a Zahra not the lady blessed with light? Was a Zahra not the lady blessed with light? Was Fatima's soul not the purest in sight? Muhammad said, Fatima is part of me. Whoever hurts my dear daughter has hurt me. Muhammad said, Fatima is part of me. Whoever hurts my dear daughter has hurt me. The Quran named her Al Kawthar. We all know through her progeny, through her, the progeny of Taha would grow. The Quran named her Al Kawthar. We all know. Through her, the progeny of Taha would grow, destined to be the second half of Ali indeed. A mother like Fatima, Hussein would need. A mother like Fatima, Hussein would need. Zainab would then inherit her mother's pain. But for this outstanding patience, she would gain. 
before them Hassan's burial rejected and Muhsin from his mother's womb ejected before them Hassan's burial rejected and Muhsin from his mother's womb ejected Ali's heart was bruised not just Fatima's rib Ali's heart was bruised, not just Fatima's rib. The whole house was emptied, not just Muhsin's crib. Before she leaves to Ali, she turns and states, before she leaves to Ali, she turns and states, my love, these are my final words and dictates, my dear Haidar, please bury me in the dark. My dear Haidar, please bury me in the dark the whereabouts of my grave. Please leave no mark. I don't want the people to know where I rest. In my funeral, allow only the best. I don't want the people to know where I rest. In my funeral, allow only the best. Alas, her grave has been veiled from you and me. Alas, her, her grave has been veiled from you and me, we wander in Medina, where could she be? But I know, my dear friends, where Fatima lies. But I know, my dear friends, where Fatima lies. She's in Karbala, the land of tears and cries. She's in Karbala, the land of tears and cries. She cries. She's with her dear son Hussein and Abbas too. She's with her dear son Hussein and Abbas too waiting for their lovers that's me and you fatima for your intercession i plead accept me as your her so humble servant indeed fatima for your intercession i plead accept me as your humble servant indeed sallallahu alaihi wa ali muhammad